it was just my go-to. You know, I always felt like I could turn somebody with a half Nelson no matter what, no matter what they did. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's it's five percent of the ingredient it pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort it humbled me taught me humility nothing can hit humble you more than wrestling i think it's the learning to adapt right you learn you learn how to adapt you learn how to solve problems you know if i look back my time i spent wrestling if it gave me one thing more than anything else it's mental toughness ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the wrestling changed my life podcast presented by spartan combat our guest today is the great Gene Mills, the legend, the inventor of the move, the Mills, as we know it today. Gene was a two-time NCAA champ for Syracuse, a four-time All-American. He set the NCAA pen record at 107, and his domination extended way beyond NCAA wrestling. He was a 1980 Olympian. He won the 1980 Tbilisi Tournament, which back then was tougher than the World's or the Olympics. He's won multiple World Cups. He's been inducted into the Hall of Fame, and today he's a wrestling coach out in New York. Absolute legend and an honor to have Gene Mills on the podcast. Fan of the Week goes to our friend L Eagle 85 who left us an Apple Podcast review, five-star review, titled Awesomeness. Thank you for starting and conducting this awesome podcast. So much insight, knowledge, and personable stories to learn from and enjoy. Keep up the great interviews. Thank you very much, L Eagle 85 Last but not least, folks, our new sponsor for this season, it's Quant Wrestling, Q-U-A-N-T. Quant sponsored us last season, and they're back for a second season. Quant takes the money ball approach to wrestling, and what I mean by that is they combine over 550 match stats from the Division I ranks, they log all those stats into their cloud analytics platform and then use predictive modeling to predict match outcomes. And these guys track everything, folks. They track, you know, how many shots attempted from neutral, how many shots defended from neutral. Every important match stat that you can think of, Quant takes it, categorizes it, and then spits it into their algorithm to provide match insights, so go to Quant Wrestling, Q-U-A-N-T, on the Apple App Store and download now. That's Quant Wrestling, Q-U-A-N-T, on the Apple App Store. And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for the great Gene Mills. All right, Gene Mills, welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you. Excited to have you. A real legend in the sport. I want to go back to Jersey. Talk to me about stories of your father, Eugene, and you kind of working out in the basement as a young kid. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when I first started wrestling, my father wanted to teach me, so we'd roll around in the uh, living room. Obviously, my mother would yell at us. So we set up a bunch of carpets down the basement, and we'd wrestle down the basement, and he'd uh, teach us stuff and wrestle with us. And then uh, my junior year, um, somebody was getting rid of a wrestling mat. So we got that and put it down the basement. So we spent a lot of time down there. And what so, kind of, what were mats like back then? Was this like a mat like we have now or? Yeah, they were the Resolate mats, you know, the heavy ones. But it was, I don't know what it was, maybe a 10 by 12 or something like that. It was small, but it worked. A lot of mat wrestling. There wasn't a lot of room to do takedowns, but enough room to wrestle on the mat, which is where I like to be anyway. 
And what kind of background did your pops have with the sport? So I guess my father in, in high school, he was 28 and 0 going into the semifinals of the States, lost three to two in the semifinals. And he, uh, the guy who beat him got the outstanding wrestler for beating him. And uh, then he went to the army and he wrestled in the army. And, uh, you know, just, he just loved the sport. And was he the one who initially got you into wrestling? Yeah. No, um, well, I had two younger brothers, so we would we would wrestle in the living room all the time. But when I got to high school, um, I actually was going to go out for basketball the first day, and the basketball coach said, uh, "Go down the hall where they were wrestling mats." And so I was kind of mad at him because I was like four foot ten, eighty eight pounds, but I was good. So I went down there, and I just. Everybody I wrestled, I just envisioned it being the basketball coach, and I just wanted to torture them. <laughs> so, any any experience with wrestling before that, or was that the first time you got started? Well, they had two weeks of wrestling in junior high in gym class, in phys ed class. So, that was a lot of fun. But there was no place to do it. There was no place to go wrestle. You know, where you could play basketball all year round. But there were no programs anywhere. So it's not like I could have jumped into a, a youth program or anything. So, and they didn't have junior high wrestling against other schools. All they had was a high school program back then. And what about off season wrestling? Were you doing a lot of that in high school? Well, after my freshman year, yes. So I was big into baseball and I was on the, the town team, the high school team and the all-star team, but I wanted to work out every night. So was, I started kind of not going to practices and telling the coaches that I've, you know, I had wrestling Then I was missing some of the games because of wrestling and I just fell in love with wrestling. So I just did that like 365 days a year. So what do you love about it? I loved the challenge. I loved embracing the fact that uh, somebody was a lot bigger than I was and stronger than I was, and I was going to figure out a way to sneak attack them and, and get them, you know, find a way to beat them. So now there are so many kids nowadays, they, they're so afraid to lose in front of other people. Me, I just embraced the challenge. You know, I knew my my freshman year when I went out, that we had, uh, I was four foot ten, eighty eight pounds, but we had a one twenty two pounder and a one forty eight pounder that were really, really good. And you know, I would want to wrestle those guys all the time. I couldn't do much with them, but I sure as hell wasn't going to back down from them. And I just think it made me way better. You know, I always wanted to wrestle the best kids. So you had that fight and confidence within you even before wrestling, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yep. I like the challenge. A lot of kids nowadays are afraid of a challenge. And that's it kind of stinks. It's like something that as a coach, you have to try to talk them into embracing, you know. Why do you think that is with kids these days? They don't. I think kids are a lot more self-conscious now about uh, what other people think. And I never cared what anybody else thought because I knew what I wanted. I knew I wanted to get better. It didn't matter. I'd, I'd rather wrestle a better guy and lose than wrestle an easy guy and pin him just because, to me, it wasn't about my record. It was about getting better so I could beat the best kids. And I, wasn't, I knew I wasn't going to beat the best kids if, you know, if I ran away from the competition. So... And once you got into the thick of it in high school, you're going out your freshman year, your sophomore year. How did you do with the New Jersey States, your junior and senior years? My, uh, actually, by my sophomore year, I was um, 24 and 0 going into the quarterfinals of the States, and I lost to two time state champ in a close match. And then uh, there were no wrestle backs. And then my junior year, I got back to the quarterfinals of the States again, and I got upset by another guy who was undefeated. 
um, um, who he paid back quite a few times in college. But, um, you know, he got a quick lead on me and held it off. And that burned in me. You know, I, I, I didn't want to ever lose that feeling of what that felt like because, you know, my senior year, I just wanted to make sure that wasn't ever going to happen again. So, you know, my senior year, I did really well. I had, uh, I think, out of thirty-one matches, I pinned twenty-six. I had, I had one decision and one major decision, and then I had what they called superior decisions, which is by fifteen or more or something. You know. So you're soft. Then, so no wrestle backs at all, even for like semi losers, mm -hmm. or you, they got to go for third and fourth. Semi losers got to go for third and fourth, but quarterfinal losers did not get to wrestle back. Wow. So. Man, so you're yep. so your sophomore year you get there you lose and you're th probably definitely thinking you're gonna come back and win it, you know your junior year. So when you lost your junior year, how did you kind of process that loss in the days after it? I was devastated, and I went to tournaments every weekend hoping that I was going to get that kid that beat me because he scored five points right away. And as soon as I got up, I got two more. And next thing you know, it was seven one. I came back and it was seven six. And I let him go with like eight seconds to go and took him down out of balance. Took him down again out of balance. I lost eight six. So it was I knew I I knew I could beat him. So I never got to wrestle him again until college. And then uh I'm sure you know what those results were. So. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you uh, <laughs> when did you start working on what was called back then the half Nelson system? Well, I almost had to develop it my freshman year in high school because I was always told you had to break a guy down before you could turn him. And being four foot ten, eighty eight pounds, wrestling guys that were cutting down from you know one hundred and twenty and being a lot bigger and stronger, I couldn't break them down. So I just started stuffing their head and putting a half on and ripping them over. And then I pinned guys and then my coaches would yell at me saying, you can't do that. You know, you got lucky. Don't do that again. And then it was either do that or lose because these guys were just a lot bigger and stronger than I was. So I couldn't beat them. So I just pinned them, you know. So to me, it was easier to pin a guy than it was to try to beat him. When did you start so, capturing the wrist? Like on the the far side, if you're halfing on this side, when did you start grabbing that piece of it? Um, well, my my freshman year, I would be stuffing the head, and then as I'd start to turn, I'd catch that wrist, and then, uh, you know, I mean, I developed that my freshman year, and then people would always be like, "Well, the guy can do this if you do that next time," and I'd be like, "Okay, bring it on." Well, then I'll just do this. And then they said, well, he can do this. And I said, well, I'll just do this. And every counter they came up with, I found a counter to the counter. And and here we are. And we have the Mean Gene Half Series. So, Yeah, I mean, I every wrestler mm -hmm. knows the Mills. And it's cool to know the person that it was named after, like in, in real life. Like this, is, this isn't something that happened 200 years ago, just like John Smith and his low single, you know. So you... You start to come up with yeah. start to come up with this and started with the half on on the guy's knees. When did you start to put like a system around it and start to think about different setups and different kind of counter moves? Was that in high school or later on in your career? Yeah, pretty much my sophomore year. I in my sophomore and junior year, and I let it evolve year after year after year. And um I don't know, it was just my go to. You know, I always felt like I could turn somebody with a half Nelson no matter what no matter what they did. Including freestyle. So, yeah. And then like in high school, they, they always told me, well, you're getting away with it now, but you'll never get away with it at the, at the regionals or the States. And then I, you know, pin the guys in the state finals. And then they said, well, you'll never get away with that at the, you know, high school national level. And then I pinned my way through that, except one guy beat 19 to four. And then they said, uh, you know, you'll never get away with that in college. <laughs> well, I have the NCAA Division One pin record. Um, and they said, well, it will never work internationally. It will never work in freestyle. 
uh, pin the guys that took first, second, third, and fourth in the Olympics. So I don't know who else there is to pin. But <laughs> <laughs> tell me I can't, and I'll do it. <laughs> I love it. It's like a. It very much reminds me of Ben Askren talking about his scrambling and, and people are skeptics early on. Then he kind of proved it out. And it's interesting hearing him talk about how he started to develop, you know, setups and counters to it. And it sounds like you were doing the same thing, right? Like if, if you threw a mills mm -hmm. on someone and they started defending in a certain way, you had a number of things you could do based on that. Yep. Pretty cool. I mean, I don't know how many guys in high school that are inventing new uh, applications of holds. That makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you were coming out of high school, initially you were recruited by a kind of a local school and that coach went to LSU. How did Syracuse get on your radar? Um, One of my friends went there and he kept telling me if I don't go to Syracuse, he'll have to be the starting 118 pounder. He didn't want to be. <laughs> he didn't want to have to lose that weight because <laughs> he couldn't beat the 26 or 34 pounder. So he would have had to go down to 118. So he's like, please, you got to come here. And he goes, you'll do way better than me. And he said, plus, I don't want to have to cut that weight. <laughs> so <laughs> were college coaches skeptical of being that you were a lighter weight wrestle coming in, if you could even make the weight? Uh, yeah. Like when I went to the Clarion, I think I weighed 106 on my recruiting trip and they said I was too small. So um, I was coach Bob Bub and he's a great guy. I love the guy, but um, you know, he made a mistake and you know, he just told me I was too small so they couldn't offer me any money. So, um, you know, after I took third in the NCAAs my freshman year and their guy who lost to the reach to the NCAA champ in the quarters or semis the year before they thought he was going to win the NCAAs he didn't even place and I took third and I was like yeah too bad I was too small you know and coach Bob has a great sense of humor I love the guy but um you know I didn't go to school there because he said I was too small and then after I had signed my national letter of intent I remember walking to the mailbox coming home and as I walked in the door the phone was ringing and it was Larry Shackatano from Montclair State who just went to LSU and he had offered me a full ride. And I, I was like, Shack, I've been, I want to go to Montclair State to wrestle for him. And, um, but when he left, you know, I didn't hear from him for three weeks and I didn't think he was going to call me, but he just called me about 15 minutes too late, which, you know, wow. you know but I mean, I, I love what I did. I probably, I wouldn't change it for anything, but at the time, I probably would have chose LSU just because I wanted to be coached by Shaq, uh, Larry Shackatano. How did you know him growing up? Or what made um, you want to wrestle I lived for him? About, Well, I lived about 20 minutes from Montclair State, and I lived in Pompton Lakes, New Jersey. And I would go up there, and, uh, you know, in high school, I would go up there, and I would go watch their team wrestle and everybody was really nice there. I liked it. And I was very family orientated and I wanted to be close to home. I wanted them to come be, you know, come to be able to watch me wrestle all the time. So I thought it was like a perfect fit. And back then, if you wanted D three nationals, you could go to the division one nationals. Now, now they don't let them do that anymore. So that's kind of a shame because I think there's a lot of kids that, you know, could do something. You know? Yeah. No, no question about it. I think, you know, you look at the guys who did come through Dan Russell, Tim Wright. I mean, there's, and you know, of course, Carl Hasselrig, right. That's the guy they, they kind of, they call it the Hasselrig rule while they stop letting programs do that. Yeah. But why? I know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm with you. I think it'd be, there's no, no fan at division ones would be angry if they saw a D2 or D3 guy there. It would just add fun to the tournament to follow that guy through and see how he does. Yeah, look at Cal State Bakersfield back then was Division two, you know. You know they had Joe Gonzalez, Johnny Azevedo, Stephen Neal, you know. 
Oh yeah. my God. Those guys were awesome. You know? Yeah. Killers. And then Joe C goes to Oklahoma state, you know, and then that, that he was the one who was coaching those guys at, at, uh, at Bakersfield or Fullerton, I believe it was. Yeah. So when you get to college, yeah. what was the, uh, I'm just curious, what was the oh. Syracuse wrestling room like back then? What did it look like? We had what they called a Quonset hut, an old army Quonset hut. And there were two full wrestling mats in the middle of it. And on one end, they had dorm rooms. On the other end, they had Coach Carlin's office and a weight room and showers and bathrooms. And um, it was pretty cool. We got to live right there. So I would literally step out into the hallway. I could take one step to the right and I'd be on the wrestling mats. So it was awesome. I loved it. What I can't so, even I wouldn't trade I, that in for anything. That I was, can't even picture what this would look like. So it's like a like a huge tent that you guys would stay in, or like an actual building. Yeah, it was a building, but it, it was kind of like a half bubble, you know, and and it was long. And when you walk in, there was a little um lobby, and then you go you, and then if you go to the right, there was a little hallway with three rooms. Then you make a left, there was one room to the right. And then the wrestling room. But from that lobby, there was a staircase upstairs with two huge rooms. And then if you go through the wrestling room in the back, coach's office was back there and, you know, a weight room and a locker room. And then they had stairs behind that. And they had one or two rooms upstairs above the offices. So, you know, wrestlers could live there. It was was freaking awesome. That's like the first standalone facility. You know, you hear about these programs now with these mega complexes, but that sounds pretty awesome. Well, yeah, it wasn't a very modern building. (laughs) It was kind of like an eyesore. (laughs) You'd be driving by and go, what the heck is that? That's where I live. (laughs) (laughs) And and for you guys, what was the practice structure back then? A lot of drilling or mostly live? Um, we, we always had, uh, you know, assistant coaches that taught us some good technique and we, uh, drill the technique. And then from there we do, we do a lot of drilling and then we do a lot of technique situations to live. So Mm -hmm. I, I really like that. So. And one of the main, or not, maybe not the main, but one of the technicians during that time was actually from Iran. Coach Hamid, how did that all get situated? So Hamid Kermanshaw um, wanted to come to the U.S. and he wanted to get a green card. So we helped him get a green card. And he was phenomenal. He was, he was unbelievable. And I think Hamid was there for eight years. And in eight years, I never took him down. What? Not once. Nope. And I, you know, I had made the Olympic team. I had won World Super Championships in Japan, and my way through it. I had won a World Cup a few times. I, I just couldn't take Hamid down. And uh, I remember one day we were training for the '84 Olympics, and we had a bunch of really unbelievably great USA wrestlers there. We had four-time NCAA finalist, two-time national champ, uh, Daryl Burley there. We had uh, Pete Schuyler, who was third a few times. We had Joe Corso, who was second in the world. We had Ricky Delicata, who had pinned Bella Glauzoff a couple times. We had Andre Metzger, who was second in the world a few times. Myself, and we're all going round robins with Hamid. And Hamid just kind of toyed with us and um he wasn't even trying he what he never exerted himself in practice i never saw him he'd try ever and um he would he would let you he would let you take his leg pick it up over his head and he'd just look at you and say five bucks says you no take me down <laughs> and we couldn't do it 
and, and uh, it was just crazy. And I remember, you know, that was probably my eighth year of being coached by Hamid. And I remember going as hard as I could after him. And, you know, I was getting so frustrated and upset. I'm like, I can't believe I've never taken him down. And so next thing you know, I have like tears in my eyes. I just couldn't believe it. How can I pin all these guys, pin everybody in the world, and I can't even score a takedown on them? And then he looked at me and he's like, oh, you okay? And I, I was like, he's freaking bullshit. You know, I've never been able to take you down. He goes, oh, you this close, you this close. Oh, come on, you, you got to try harder, you know. He goes, come on, let's go, let's go. And he let me take him down. He goes, oh, look, see, you did it, you did it. Come on, come on, let's go again, go hard, hard, hard. And he let me take him down again. Then he let me do it again. And then I got up and then I lost it on him. And then I kind of used some cuss words and said that was freaking bullshit. You let me take you down and you know it. And he goes, no, you did it. I'm like, yeah, right. Yeah, I can't get one in eight years and I get three in a row. Sure, I did. But he was just trying to make me feel good because he was, you know, sweetheart of a human being. <laughs> they like to make you look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> he was unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. Was, what a treasure to he, have him as an assistant coach during that time. Oh my God. Yeah. Yep. And then you, you know, you get into certain situations and he, you know, he would coach you up in those situations. Huh? If you get stuck here, you can do this, you can do that, you can, you know. And he was phenomenal. He wow. he really, really was. Was he uh, yeah. an elite wrestler, or did he do mostly coaching? So, and so, um, well, he he had won the worlds, and then oh, he was, he, a world he was on the Iranian Olympic team, and he broke his wrist before. Yeah, and so, um, and when it came time for the Olympics, he had uh, broke his wrist, and the guy he pinned in the finals of the Iranian national finals went and took. Uh, I think that guy took third and third or fourth at, at the 72 Munich Olympics. So. Holy smokes. Yeah. That's incredible. Is he still in the U S he's in New York city. He coaches at the New York athletic club and at the Henzo Gracie <coughs> jujitsu Academy in New York city. And he teaches the wrestling stuff down there and he still wrestles live at 70 years old. Oh my! And nobody gosh. can take him down. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That that's crazy because there's a couple of Iranians who defected before the revolution, which really, you know, I wouldn't really understand why, but um, because in 79 they had the big revolution. So he came over before then. There was another great Iranian though who was at Gable's weight in 72. Um, Mohavid. Did he ever talk about him or did he ever come through and work out with you guys? Um, I don't think he came and worked out with us, but yeah, Hamid would talk about him all the time. Yep. Yeah, legend. So um, they had some, they had some, they had some great, great wrestlers there out of Iran. Yeah. So. And and outside of uh, outside of Coach Hamid, it sounds like the head coach was Ed Carlin. Mm hmm. What was his philosophy yep. to like training and development? Well, his biggest thing was. Um, he was like a second dad to all the guys and he would just believe in us. And he would take guys that never even went to the state tournament and just get them to believe in themselves and turn them into all Americans. And, um, you know, a, a lot to do with the assistant coaches techniques, but just the fact that he was like a second dad, you didn't want to lose for your dad, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, you'd run through a wall for the guy. So and getting kids yeah, to believe is like, it's such an interesting thing that sometimes that's all it takes for someone to break through. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and like at, at the beginning, I don't know how much he believed in me because my first three weeks of wrestling practice in college, I don't, I, I never scored a point. Um, it was really frustrating and I was kind of homesick and I kind of wanted to leave. And then we had this, URI quad, a quad at the University of Rhode Island. And then uh, I pinned two of the three guys and shut out the other guy. And I remember, uh, you know, after that, all of a sudden I was able to beat like half the team after that. But, it, oh my God, my first three weeks in, rest in the wrestling room kind of sucked because 
these guys were just so much bigger, stronger. And, you know, I thought I was Joe Cockala coming out of high school, you know, like I thought I was better than everybody. I was just, I wasn't as big or strong and I, I couldn't figure out a way to score my first three weeks. But, you know, once I, uh, once I turned that corner, I was in good shape. <laughs> so you were able to beat not only the guys at the URI duel, but also guys on your team who the week prior you were getting you were getting schooled by a little bit. Yep. Yeah, there were still a few guys that couldn't beat, you know, um, and it took some time, but uh, you know, <laughs> it was, I embraced the challenge every day, and I wanted to go with the guys that were better than me. And you know, once I started scoring, you know, and getting the better of certain guys, once I started getting the better of them, I, I, it's almost like I didn't want to, I wanted the next guys, I wanted the guys that could beat me. So. <laughs> You're an animal. What were you doing outside of the the practices in the afternoon? What was your routine for like morning after practice, that kind of thing? Um, Practice. So I'd get up in the morning and I'd work out and then go to class and then I'd go to practice and then I'd go to dinner and then I'd, go to practice and then I'd hang out with guys on the team. And then sometimes I would work out at midnight. I mean, I just loved it. I, I lived in a wrestling building. I, I had access 24 hours a day. Wow. So it, it was pretty cool. There's a lot of times I'd work out three, four times a day because I could, I step out my door and literally I didn't even have to step into the hallway. I could stretch my foot out and step on a wrestling mat and there would be two full mats and, it would be like, hey, who wants to wrestle? So I'd be constantly trying to find somebody to wrestle with me. I just can't believe so, that that was your your wrestling room setup. I I wonder if there's any pictures of that building online anywhere. Um, let's see. I might be able to pull up some of them. Because the having yeah, the dorms was, there is really nice. Oh, my God. It was so awesome. Um, let's see, wrestling picks. I know I have pictures of when they started tearing it down. Oh, it's tore down now. I didn't want to ask. Yeah. And did the yeah, coaches live there too, it. or just the wrestlers? No, just the wrestlers. <laughs> <laughs> the coaches and families, that's the last place they'd want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. You can send it to me after if you have it. No big yeah. deal. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it's just like an old army Quonset hut. It was it was pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Googling the All term right. Quonset yeah. hut because I'd never heard that term before, but I'm looking it up now. I see what you're talking about now. Kind of like a long kind of curved building. Okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that's just that so this is where you know you're this is your home and i'm sure afterwards after college too you're you're spending a lot of time training there i want to go to a couple quotes i found about an article that was written about you in 1981 you have the pdf on your website and there's a couple quotes in there i thought were really cool one of which is your girlfriend at the time described you as an eternal optimist is that something you still Hold to your heart, and where did that come from? Yeah, I think that uh, came from my mother and my father. They they were eternal optimists, and they always believed in, uh, you know, in the positive stuff. So that's just such a rare thing, though. Like so many people you meet are pessimists or they're not believers, but to be an optimist is like one of the most powerful things I think you could describe someone as. well, I always believed I could do it. So no matter what it was, you know, I mean, I, I believe in myself. I believe I could do anything. You and know, did you ever have I, like self doubt or like, it, like kind of that internal voice trying to talk you out of it? Like some people have. No, there were sometimes I'd be like, shit, I got my hands full today, but let's go. You know, I mean, I, I always embrace the challenge. I love And that's what I try to get kids to do. You know, the kids sometimes are so afraid. I don't want to go out there. He's going to kill me. No, embrace that challenge. 
You got nothing to lose. That guy's better. He's better. I go, if you score on that guy, that's a win. You know? Mm-hmm. Just and you're, you're trying to you're, get... Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I I just try to get guys to believe in themselves. You know? If you're, if you're, you're still coaching right mentally, now. Yeah. If you're going to give up mentally, you lost. It's already over. Mm-hmm. And it's so rare when you in college wrestling, even at the division one level where two guys step out there and they actually both believe they can win. You know, you see in the semis, the quarters, some dual meets, but you know, they're usually the great guys in college wrestling really know that they can win. Who were some guys you wrestled against in college who you felt that they also believe they could actually win when they wrestled against you? When they wrestled against me. Yeah. Like who were some guys who you went out there with and you know that, they actually believe they can beat you. Because I'm sure your reputation preceded you. A lot of guys you wrestled, they probably didn't think they could actually win. And you just smoked them. But, you know, there's maybe four or five in the country who thought they could go even with you. And I'm just wondering who some of those guys were back then. Well, probably Joe Gonzalez. Um, you know, and he, he was phenomenal. You know, World Champ Olympia and all that stuff. He was, uh, he was probably my most respected opponent. I think there were a lot of guys my freshman year that really thought that they could beat me, but they just weren't smart enough to know yet. <laughs> they, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and when you mentioned Joe Gonzalez, everyone thinks about that insane NCAA finals match. Why do you think that one is still talked about over the, over all these years? Because we never stopped. We just kept going and going and going and going and we were constantly trying to score, you know, it's not, neither one of us went out there and tried to hold the lead. We, we both wanted to win and we both wanted to score. And I mean, he was phenomenal on his feet. He was so much better than me on his feet. Um, that's why I kept trying to grab his arm and get him to the mat. So I could have the sucker drag because I felt so much better on the mat. And I knew that was the only place that I had a chance because on my feet, he was he was so much better than I was on on his feet. So, yeah, you look at him and as a veto, like those are like just technicians on their feet. Oh, yeah, lightning fast. And that goes back to Joe Say. You know that was, yeah. You know Joe Say was their coach. You know he was our you know world team coach, and then he went to Okie State. But yeah, yeah. They had a phenomenal program at Cal State Bakersfield. How how many times did you wrestle Gonzo before that NCAA finals match that everyone talks about? Uh, just once. I wrestled him in the East-West All-Star meet. And actually, I felt like I felt like I did better in that match than I did in the finals of the NCAA. It's just at the end, I uh, I did something stupid and I tried to extend him, or I tried to uh, Merkel him to his back and I pulled him on top of me. And, um, but uh, that was another seesaw back and forth match. It was, it was crazy. Wow. So, yeah. They were, they were my two hardest matches in college. Both against Gonzo. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, it's such, hmm. And for folks who haven't watched it, it's the 79 finals or the 81 finals, the match in question. 79. And do you yeah. remember what the end score on that one was? Was it like 14, 12, something? 16, 13. Two Olympians, no, it was NCAA 13, 13. finals. Yeah. Yeah, 29 points scored. That's insane. That just doesn't happen against that caliber of, of wrestler. And you think about when Dake and David Taylor were in the finals, two Olympians. That was a very tight match. You and Gonzo, two Olympians, and you're putting up you know, 29, 30 points. I mean, that is absolutely crazy. Well, we let the shit fly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What about, um, you know, internationally at the lightweights? I always think about the great Japanese wrestlers. Did you have any of those that were always in your bracket or someone you were gunning for? Mm -hmm. So I, um, I wrestled at Yuji Takata, who was a four-time world champ and Olympic champ. And um, with eight seconds to go, it was 15, it was 15, 11 him. And I gutted him twice to tie it. 
but it was in Japan and they went like this. Because back then, if you did a cut wrench and you, if you ever hesitated, then the other guy got two also. But I didn't hesitate. But, oh, really? Oh, back then, if you did a gut wrench and you hesitated for a second before you ripped it all the way through, yeah, they'd give two to each guy. Two and two. So it had to be one continuous motion. And they said that it wasn't. Now, with eight seconds to go, you got a guy twice. You know it's continuous motion. <laughs> because... <laughs> but um, so I lost 1915 in the finals of the World Super Championships in Japan. Um, and then um, I, they had that uh, Asakura, um, who was two-time world champ, and I wrestled him in the finals of World Super Championships the following year. And I, I think it was 15-2 before I pinned him first period, and then um, it was 16 uh, nothing first period the other time I wrestled him. So, But that that was the year they did that stupid uh, tech fall rule. Because uh, when they had that tech fall rule, well, um, in in nineteen eighty one, um, the Russians went to the International Olympic Rules Committee and said that she was bullshit. Fifteen points in finish, and so they changed it and made it. Uh, they called it a tech fall rule. But Milan Erskan, who was the president of FILA at the time, <laughs> he would always tell me, Mills, you pay my ass. I said, why? He said, oh, Russia, always, you know, change rule, change rule, change rule. And he said, so this tech fall is the Gene Mills bullshit rule. <laughs> because they, he, they always said that it was bullshit that I could score so many points before I pin people. So what they wanted to keep you, so they added a tech fall rule to keep the matches shorter so you wouldn't pin people or what? No, I mean, like, uh, like the one year at the, at the freestyle nationals, I scored 72 points, 63 points, 72 points, you know, 49 points. And then at the world cup, I scored 43, 45, 35. And they just, you know, and then when I was wrestling a lot of the Russians world champs, they would, they would be beating me you know, in the first minute, you know, like six, nothing or whatever. And then next thing you know, it'd be 18 to six or 20 to six, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and they, you know, it would just poof on a, on a drop of a dime, like in 30 seconds, I'd score all those points. So <clears throat> they didn't like that. So they wanted to just make it a 15 point thing and, you know, call it a match. Wow. So, wow. So Milan Ersadan who was the president of FILA at the time, well, which is now UWW, would always call it the Gene Mills bullshit rule. <laughs> were things uh, as so, screwy as they were in the 2000s with FILA in terms of rules and, and referees and, and the politics of it? Or not so bad then? Yeah, it, it was it was kind of crazy. It was, it seemed like they were always changing the rules and I never knew the rules to begin with. And then they're changing them all the time. I'm like, I thought, and they're like, no. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I, you know, I just went out there and tried to smash them. I figured if something was illegal, they'd stop it. <laughs> it's funny. I was just interviewing KJ and he said the same thing. At the Olympic trials in 92, you could do continuous guts or continuous laces or something like that. And then at the Olympics in Barcelona two months later they changed it and you couldn't do one you couldn't do like a continuous gut or something like that or you had to do a different move you couldn't do two guts in a row right so it's just like so many weird things like that happened uh you know over 30 40 years of international wrestling crazy rule stuff yeah yeah now what are the super championships you keep referring to um Back then, they did a, a thing called the World Super Championships where they only invited the four best guys in the world at each weight class. So it wasn't World Championships where you had to go through three days of wrestling. You just went in there and you, you had the four best guys in the world. You, you wrestle all three of them, and it's almost like a round robin. Okay, wow. let's see who's, what you got. So it was fun. It was really fun. 
Uh, is that where Randy Lewis wrestled Sergey Belaglazov, or did? I don't um, know if they maybe they didn't wrestle actually because Randy. I remember Randy telling me about a tournament in Japan called the Super Worlds, and I didn't know what he was talking about. But as you're talking about, it's coming mm-hmm. back to me a little bit. It's called the World Super Championships. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, and now what you were when you made the team in eighty, were you at one hundred fourteen and a half? Ouch. Yes. That was How brutal. talk to us about where did you start at when you would come down for that? 172. No, seriously. 172. Oh my God. I mean what but I was solid goo. Solid goo. <laughs> <laughs> what was like uh <laughs> Baker? What's like an what was like an in season weight for you? Like 135, 140, or even bigger than that? Well, my junior and senior years, I, I was getting up to 148 and then getting down 118 twice a week, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that was kind of brutal. That sucked. How, that what really was your sucked. routine? Would you just starve it out or how would you get it off? Well, some days I would eat, obviously. And then um, Sunday night, I'd just start working it off. But I didn't miss a meal. I, I kind of ate smart on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Because I always felt like if I didn't eat, I wouldn't have the energy to work out. So I never missed a meal. I just ate smart. On Sundays and Wednesday nights, that wasn't the issue. <laughs> <laughs> so on Sundays, I would eat all day till I couldn't breathe. And then I'd weigh 148. And then I'd get down to 118. And then I'd, you know, on Thursdays, I'd weigh 148. And then I have to make it on Saturday morning at 118. Oh, holy um, when I, um, for the Pan American Games, um, three weeks before, I weighed 172. And I had to get down to 114.5 and make weight three days in a row. No. Did you do it? Yeah. How? How? How much over were you on day two and day three? Like 15? No, no, 20. I, I'd put on 20 every day. It sucked. It really oh sucked. Oh my God. And what, you just throw the plastics on and get after it? Mm hmm. Yeah, back then you were allowed to use rubber suits. You know, people think the rubber suits make you lose weight. No, you still had to work your ass off. Oh my God. Like harder than, you know, any human I've seen in the last 30 years. Right. Yeah. You know, and I mean, that's just to get down to weight. That's not even, yeah, that's not even your training. That's not your conditioning. You're just doing that to get down to weight. And were you like, like uh five minutes on the tread, five minutes in the sauna, five minutes on the bike kind of guy, or what was your routine? Yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, I would always start out uh, with a run, like, a, you know, a, Go for a mile run and come back and start doing mountain climbs to get that sweat going. And once you got that sweat going, the stupidest thing to do, which a lot of these kids do nowadays, which I want to smack them in the head, but you really can't do that. You know, as a coach, you can't smack a kid. Um, but the second a kid breaks a sweat, they want to check their weight. Right. I'm like, wait, a minute, you didn't lose 10 pounds. You didn't lose a pound. You know, you broke a sweat. You might have lost a tenth or two tenths. Come on. But the hardest part is getting the sweat started. So like af- after a competition, like after, you know, they get the NCAAs or, you know, any tournament, if you have a second day weigh-ins, the second you get done with your last match, you know, you, uh, you know, you're, you know, if I know I'm 20 over before the match, I know I didn't lose 20 pounds in the match. Mm-hmm. So what they do, lose a pound. Now, does it make a difference if I lost one pound or two pounds? I still know I have 18 or 19 to go. So I get that sweat going. That's why I always tried to stick, go to the third period because I didn't want to. You know, <laughs> Wait, you would I, go to the third for weight management? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Because I didn't, you know, I didn't try to pin people, you know, in tournaments because I wanted to get a sweat going. Um, you know, and then once you get that sweat going, then you throw, you know, like a long sleeve t-shirt on, and you throw a rubber suit on, and you throw a sweatshirt on, and you know. 
drawing long johns, you know, rubber suit, and then uh, sweatpants on top of that. You put a hat on, and gloves, and you <laughs> go to work. Work out like a you know, work out like a banshee. And then boof, you know, you you know, you work out hard for an hour, and next thing you know, now you're only like five over. Like, right. You know, you're in striking distance. What's the latest you had to stay up throughout the night to make weight? Well, the Pan Am games, I literally, I would take hour breaks to sleep. And then I'd get back up and work out for two hours, take an hour break to sleep, take and work out for two hours, take an hour, you know, hours to sleep. And so, that you know, and it was down in Puerto Rico, it was like 90 degrees. Mm-hmm. You know, and and then uh, our, one of our coaches, Gene Davis, would uh, bring me into the sauna at the end and uh, if if it weren't for him, I would have never made way to the Pan American Games. I don't know how I did it three days in a row. That was brutal. Did you uh, win it still? Yeah. Yeah, I had to wrestle the guy who was third in the world a couple times. Luis Sokanya from Cuba. Cuban, yeah. Cubans yeah. were tough, still are. Um, yeah. Wow. He didn't, he didn't know what a half was, so. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, um, okay. So I know you're uh you're you're a teacher and we have about 10 minutes left until class, if not less. How are we doing? Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. So obviously we could talk for five hours. There's a few key events I have to ask you about. Tell me about Tbilisi. When it was your first time going to Tbilisi? Uh 1980. And we were in remember we were in Lincoln, Nebraska, and President Carter had made an announcement that he did not want um us to go over there. He didn't want to, or no, he made an announcement that we might boycott the Olympics and he really didn't want American citizens going to the Soviet Union because of the Cold War was going on. You know, Iran had just taken over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. We were going to be 125 miles from the Iranian border in, in Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, well, the hostage then, crisis was going on. And yep, so the hostage crisis, that happened in December and then we went we went to Tbilisi in January and the Russians were taking over Afghanistan. And so President Carter, you know, was didn't want anybody going over there for the Olympics because we wanted to try to hurt their economy. And then he didn't really want us to go. So I started thinking about it. And that movie had just come out, Midnight Express. I don't know if you're I haven't old watched enough it. to remember that. No. You've never watched it? No. Well, it was about some guy tried to smuggled drugs out of Turkey and they held them hostage and tortured them. And I started thinking about all that stuff. I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to be held hostage. I didn't want to get killed. I remember calling home, talking to my mother and saying, Ma, you know, I don't know what you think, but I don't want to be held hostage. I don't want to get killed. And she's like, honey, don't go. I talked to my father. I'm like, Pop Tart, what do you think? And he's like, don't go. The boss, you know, I talked to my high school coach and my college coach and they all told me not to go. So I remember talking to our coach, Stan Desick. And I'm like, uh, coach, I don't think I'm going to go. And he started yelling at me. He goes, what do you mean you're not going to go? He goes, I've been there four or five times. He goes, it's safe. He goes, you got to go. And, you know, next thing you know, he's one minute he's yelling at me. Next minute he's got tears in his eyes. He goes, you don't understand. In 22 years, we've only had four Americans ever win this tournament. You know, we've had Olympics where we'd have three or four champs. He goes, but we've only had four winners in, in 22 years, but they have the best of the best of the best there. It's not like the World's Olympics where there's one guy representing Eurasia. They had all those national champs, and you know, and sometimes the top two, three guys. And when he, he looked at me and he goes, you don't understand. He goes, um, you know, this is the hardest tournament in the world. And he goes, and I honestly believe that you could kill those commies. And when he said that, I was like, kill the commies. Let's I'm go. In. Let's go. And that was it. And so, you know. And at this there, point, and I, they hadn't boycotted the Olympics. They're just talking about it, right? Correct. Things are heating up we, a little bit. Yeah. And we when we first flew over there, um, one of the first places that we went to, they brought us into like this conference room. And they had like these double doors and they closed them. And they had like the hooks coming out and they took a big board and put it there and they had guys standing there with Uzis and they were asking us, what is this that you might not be coming back for the Olympics? And we're like, oh no, we're coming back. And I remember Coach Desik telling them that we were, you know, we won't let President Carter stop us, that we would go to 
Germany two weeks earlier and then fly from there if we had to, but we're coming back. But um, it's kind of scary. You know, they were pretty offended that we were talking about not going. But we had nothing to do it. We didn't want to, we didn't yeah. want to boycott. It wasn't our choice. Like you guys had, yeah, like you said, like had anything to do with it. Not even, like, I don't think they realize how big the, you know, the, the, the powers that be are here. So when you get yeah. there, and to your point, I don't think people realize when the Soviet Union was going on, all those republics were in the USSR. So to make the Soviet team was really an incredible feat. But to your point, at the world, you only had one of them. You didn't have the Azerbaijani. You didn't have, um, what, who, who are some other ones? Kazakhstan. I mean, Ukraine. I mean, it goes on and on, right? All those countries are solid wrestling. Yeah. Georgia, all right? So, but at the Tbilisi, yeah. they're all in that tournament. And back then they were using something called the black mark system. What's that? So the black mark system is um, if you got beat, you got three black marks and the winner got one. And that's the way they used to do the Olympics. And that's kind of, think about Gray Simons. Gray Simons was 6-0 and at the Olympics and had six, six decisions. So he got a point each time. So he had six wins. And he was out of the tournament. What? That doesn't seem you fair. Six, if, you have six, if you have six bad marks, you're done. So if you beat a guy by, um, by I think it was 12 or more back then, or eight, if you beat him by eight or more, you got a half a bad mark. If you beat him by 12 or 15, whatever it was, or more, or pin them, you got no bad marks, and the other guy got all four of them. So, I mean... You know, I, I pinned right. everybody except in the finals. I had to wrestle that uh, that Urali Shagayov, who beat Bella Glauzov by a major decision the year before. What? And they didn't let him go to the Olympics because they said he was too young. Um, so I had him in the finals, and he had beaten everybody by twenty going into the finals. And um, I I didn't pin him. I was beating him eighteen nothing at the end of the first period, and they disqualified him beginning a second because he was just run away because he. He didn't know what to do with me. Wow. Just, you know, beating him up. What was like the, well, and for folks who weren't there, give us a little bit of the atmosphere. What, what was the crowd like? What was the venue like? I mean, were they way into it? Venue, or was it a little everybody bit was wearing black, brown, or gray. There were no <laughs> colors whatsoever. So, yeah. And I, I've got my class coming in. No problem. I'll let you go. Gene Mills, we got to have you back on, man. It's been so much fun just to talk about some of the early parts of your career. Thank you so much for your time, sir. I greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wrestling Changed My Life with Gene Mills. This episode was presented by Quant Wrestling. Quant is wrestling by the numbers. They combine data analytics with the great sport of college wrestling. They track and time every activity in a wrestling match to produce 550 stats that update on a daily basis once we get into the thick of the NCAA season. Go to Quant Wrestling on the Apple App Store now to sign up. And that's it, folks. We'll see you next, well, excuse me, later this week. We'll see you later this week for another episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. Peace! Life. Peace! Life. Peace! Life. Peace! Life. Peace! Life. Peace! Life. Peace.